Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us for today's webinar, The Spread and Emergence of Tick-Borne Pathogens in Central Canada Under Climate Warming, brought to you by the Canadian Public Health Association through the Infectious Disease and Climate Change Project. Our webinar series aims to explore current and emerging infectious disease and climate change topics to share knowledge, research, and best practices. My name is Maddie Schuler, Project Officer with CPHA, and I will be the moderator for today's webinar. Before we begin, we want to acknowledge that the Canadian Public Health Association's office is situated on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people, and I'm currently tuning in from the traditional homeland of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and the Huron-Wendat. They have been the guardians of this land for a millennia, and we are grateful for the example their stewardship provides. CPHA is committed to working with all First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples and their governments in realizing meaningful truth and reconciliation. Before we begin, I wanted to take a quick minute to show everyone a couple of the winning posters from CPHA's 2023 Infectious Disease and Climate Change Grade 6 Poster Contest, which actually just closed uh, March 31st of this year. So this contest was an opportunity for teachers and students to learn more about climate change and the impact it is having on the spread of infectious diseases like West Nile virus and hantavirus in our communities. So our judges had their work cut out for them this year and had the difficult task of carefully reviewing over 900 impressive submissions. Um, on the left, the West Nile virus poster is actually our 2023 national winner. And to the right, um, the hantavirus poster is our national runner up. And there was an additional six regional winners from across Canada. And you can see all eight winning posters at cpha.ca forward slash contest. Um, and I really encourage you to do so because like I said, they were all very impressive this year um, and covered a wide range of infectious disease topics. Um, and it was really, really exciting to see um, children engage with these topics. Just a few quick housekeeping notes. Um, if you have any questions for our presenters today or technical difficulties, please type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, if there's a technical difficulty that many people are experiencing, I will just quickly pause the webinar to address it. But as for questions, we'll hold those until the end. And then after the presentation, I will read out the questions and our presenters will have the opportunity to answer them. And we do strongly encourage attendee participation and look forward to hearing your thoughts and questions today. Secondly, our webinar is being recorded and will be made available on CPHA's YouTube channel a few days after the end of this presentation and presentation slides will also be shared. Lastly, we would love to get your feedback. So after the webinar, please fill out our five minute survey which will open automatically in your browser once you close Zoom. Now I would like to introduce our speakers for today's webinar. Kirsten Crandall, she, they, is a joint PhD candidate at McGill University and the University of Ottawa. She studies the abiotic and biotic factors affecting the pathogen tick host disease system in Canada. She integrates a wide variety of methods such as meta-analyses, field surveys, GIS analyses, and genetic work to disentangle this complex disease system. Kirsten is also a coordinator for STEM Diversity's mentorship program, a writer and translator for the Biomatters magazine, and a science outreach enthusiast. <clears throat> Dr. Jeremy Kerr is a professor of biology at the University of Ottawa, where he is chair of department and holds a university research chair in macroecology and conservation. He has won many awards for his research and for science communication and was recently elected as a lifetime fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Dr. Virginie Millien is an associate professor at the Red Path Museum and biology department at McGill University. Her group studies the effect of environmental changes on species distribution and local adaptation, as well as the pattern of emergence of vector-borne diseases. And with that, I will turn it over to our speakers. Okay, so this is Jeremy Kerr speaking, and what I'm going to try to do right now is share my PowerPoint slides. I do expect this will work without too much trouble, but Someone could please confirm for me that that is actually visible. Yes, looks wonderful. Right, we're good to go, excellent. Today's presentation is going to be a tag team between um, PhD candidate Kirsten Crandall, who is co-supervised by Professor Virginie Millien at McGill and me at University of Ottawa. What I'm gonna do is I'm going to introduce some aspects of global change 
and start to talk about some of their implications, these aspects of global change, on the distributions of species. This will become, um, the relevance of this will become very obvious towards the end of my section as I begin to transition into the influences of these aspects of global change on the distributions of vectors that are competent for transmitting various kinds of disease. Global changes, especially land use change and climate change are widespread and ongoing. But sometimes it is very easy for us to overlook the pervasiveness and the pace of these kinds of global change. After all, we all live in our own environments and there is literally nothing that we encounter more than the world that is immediately around us. Human beings are essentially evolved to detect difference. And because we encounter the world around us on a routine basis every single day, we tend to overlook just how quickly things can change in many instances. This map shows the world's uh, various forms of land use change that have taken place over just the last 40 years. And what this paper points out from 2021 in Nature Communications is that a little bit more than 30% of the surface of the world has been modified in some way just since 1961. And if you extrapolate these kinds of recent changes to encompass all of the forms of land use change and intensification that have taken place around the world, then well over 80% of the entire surface of the earth, that is terrestrial areas, have been directly modified for human use. In other words, the rate and the extent of human modifications of habitats at a global scale is truly phenomenal. And as you might expect, given just a little bit of biological knowledge, there is a pretty strong likelihood that changes on that kind of scale would have very significant biotic consequences, which can range from accelerating extinction rates at global and within regional scales, but also on the distribution and redistribution of vectors that are responsible for transmitting some of the most dangerous diseases that are currently extant. Yet another aspect of global change, of course, is climate change. This is a, a graph of temperature difference that was in the sixth assessment report, and I'm sure that everybody is very familiar with this. It essentially just shows that the general trend towards rapid climate change is a relatively recent phenomenon from about 1975 or so onward. But climate changes have been ongoing due to human activities since perhaps 150 years ago, although the pace of that change is, is quite slow prior to 1975-ish and quite rapid after that time. Yet what this graph shows us is shifts in a global average of temperature. In other words, it is concealing a number of different characteristics that may indeed be considerably more important for understanding the distribution of life on Earth, including these disease vectors that we're concerned with today. First of all, we are integrating averages at, across these spatial scales. We're measuring temperature everywhere all at once and taking an average. What that does is it conceals for us spatial variation in temperature difference that can be truly extraordinary. The second part of what is being concealed by graphs like this is short-term weather fluctuations that are a consequence of climate change and that may in some instances exert far greater biotic effects than averages of climatic conditions. And if we examine some of those shorter term differences in um, weather extremes, 
that are a consequence of global warming. And again, this is also from the IPCC sixth assessment report. What you can see is that under various climate change scenarios, we are anticipating very large differences in the frequency with which uh, different kinds of extreme weather is going to be experienced. These are global averages again. So, you know, it's, it's integrating across these enormous spatial areas. There's lots of variation from one place to the next. But if we look at just the bottom part of this graph for a very short moment, what you can see is that 50 year heat waves under a high climate change scenario are gonna become around about 40 times more likely. And what that means, of course, is that we will be anticipating a 50 year heat wave, a heat wave that is so extreme that historically we would only have expected to observe it once every half century. We will be observing weather that is that extreme every year or every second year on average. This is the kind of thing that is hard on everybody, not just human beings, of course, but also the species that we share the world with, and that includes disease vectors. This is a visualization of a single um, moment in time, really, from Tuesday, June 29th in 2021, looking at the distributions of extreme heat at a global scale. And of course, the hottest place in the world, more or less, at that time was in British Columbia, of all places, where the recorded temperature just shattered historical records and was nearly 50 degrees Celsius, a temperature that basically nobody associates with, with anything that happens in Canada. The consequences environmentally for changes of this kind, of course, are that you can have extraordinary uh, secondary effects, things like forest fires, but also the temperatures actually threaten the survival of human beings who are routinely exposed to such extremes. But let's think about the impacts of these kinds of changes on the distributions of species. The first thing I'm gonna just mention here, and I'm gonna do this in a very generalized way. This is from a paper that I published with a PhD and a master's student of mine about a decade or seven or eight years ago. If you look in the upper right-hand part of this slide, what you'll see is the thing that we've labeled physiological context. Essentially what we're doing is we are depicting the thermal niche of an organism in this section of the slide. And what you have on that little kind of not quite normal shaped curve is an optimal temperature within which the organism tends to do fairly well with respect to temperature, a lower critical thermal threshold and an upper critical temperature. Below that lower threshold, the organism experiences problems that can be direct and physiological as in this slide, but may also be a consequence of biotic interactions. The organisms it relies on begin to have trouble when the temperature gets too cold. But the hot end is where we have more concern these days. The upper thermal limits of organisms are being exceeded more and more frequently over time as we shift global averages of temperature, but also as we begin to impose thermal regimes that are associated with high frequencies of very hot temperatures. In other words, more frequent and more extreme heat waves. This normal curve or thermal niche in the upper right-hand corner shows three different populations, one, two, and three conveniently labeled, and the third population exists quite close to its upper thermal limits. It lives in a space that prior to climate change, it is able to tolerate, but that is you know, fairly marginal in terms of the environment. With warming, that organism is then likely to experience temperatures which exert negative effects on it. And its population, which is shown in the middle top part here, its population would be expected to begin to decline. Now, this is all hypothetical. Does this really happen? 
So there's two different things that I had on that slide. And we were looking at cold temperatures that could become warmer and that organisms might therefore be able to tolerate more easily if they had previously lived in a very cold place. This means that organisms who reach their northern range limits in places like the northern United States or southern Canada with warming may be able to shift their ranges further north as those temperatures become a little easier to tolerate. So as temperatures rise, cold is less likely to limit the distributions of those species. Here's an analysis, basically a kind of um, massive GIS analysis that we did uh, and published in Ecology in 2010 that shows the proportional differences that have already been observed across Canada based on the distributions of butterfly species. The species in the south, it doesn't look like much is changing in the southern part of Canada. And that's because we uh, limited the analyses to species that were historically present. So to see where the real differences are, what you have to do is, is, is look at mostly um, the middle bit of Canada where species that were present here historically have expanded their ranges to the north. That's the green parts of this map. And we've already seen rather large differences on average six or seven species, um, or actually more like um, 18 or 20 species. So about 6.5% of the species that exist in the Canada in Canada um, have expanded northward into the boreal zone. That's kind of like the climate change good news story. Butterflies don't bite. Butterflies don't do anything really harmful in the environment with respect to human health, for example. Uh, there's a few that are agricultural pests, but the areas that have seen significant changes in maps like this are not places where agriculture is particularly concentrated. But there's also a bad side of this coin, and that is for species that are limited in terms of their tolerance to hot weather, the increasing frequency and severity of extreme heat can begin to impose downward pressure on their populations. And this is based on a study that we published, uh, I guess about two and a bit years ago now in science. And what it looked at was bumblebee species across Europe and North America based on multiple sets of predictions and multiple different kinds of models that show that the abundance, the, the occupancy of different bumblebee species across these regions was beginning to decline and that that decline was based on how frequently temperatures exceeded the upper thermal limits of individual species. So we can think about extreme temperatures from the perspective of global averages. A temperature extreme might be something that's very different from historical conditions. But from a biological perspective, that temperature extreme only becomes really important for a particular organism if that temperature extreme exceeds that organism's individual tolerances directly or indirectly, either directly physiologically or indirectly by exerting, creating problems for environment, environmental conditions that organism relies on for example, host plants for some kinds of organisms or host species for some kinds of vectors. In other words, climate change is a two-sided coin. On the one hand, from a biological perspective, we have range expansions of many species. And on the other, we have increasing extinction risk for some kinds of species. But these sorts of things can also be very important for understanding disease risk. And this is where I will begin to transition into my colleagues' part of today's presentation. And this will be my concluding slide. By incorporating information in a very detailed way, perhaps through satellite data or field observations, one can create models that facilitate the prediction of disease risk or disease prevalence 
And this is an example of a study that I did with my postdoc, Manisha Kulkarni, and PhD uh, student, uh, Rochelle Berachet, published in 2010, in which we showed how high resolution information on thermal conditions could be used to improve the uh, distribution of uh, falciparum malaria uh, across East Africa, particularly in Tanzania and in Southern Kenya. And with that, I'm going to pause and I will pass the baton to a colleague. Who's next? There we go. Oh, sorry, Kirsten, you're muted. Thank you. No problem. <laughs> um, so thank you, Dr. Kerr. A lot of the information that uh, he went over is especially relevant when we're trying to determine where different tick-borne pathogens are located in Canada. So a lot of those influences, such as changes in climate or land use change, can definitely move and redistribute where tick and host populations are located and subsequently where disease risk is located as well. Um, what I'll be discussing today is a study that uh, I conducted as part of my PhD that's been published in Vector-Borne and Zoonotic Diseases, where we were assessing which emerging or re-emerging tick-borne pathogens were present uh, in a wide variety of different sites in Ontario and Quebec in Canada. First, I wanted to make a land acknowledgement as I visited such a wide expanse of area that I was on many different unceded traditional lands of several indigenous nations. Uh, I also wanted to pay my respects to the different beings that I had to remove from these lands as part of my research. Uh, I thought it was very important to acknowledge my responsibility within this aspect of the community. I wanted to generally discuss what the tick host pathogen disease system looks like uh, in Canada and more generally in North America uh, to make sure that we know all the associations between the key players. So first in spring, typically an adult, adult female will lay her eggs, which then molt into larvae. The larvae will then have their first blood meal. Typically it's on a ground foraging bird or a small mammal. It's at this point that if the host is infected with a pathogen, be it a bacteria, a virus, a protozoan, it may become infected as well. When they drop off of the host and molt into a nymph, it's at this point that they may also harbor that pathogen. It'll overwinter and become active in the next year where it'll feed on a more generalized set of hosts. So it could be domestic pets, such as your cats or dogs. It could be livestock, such as cattle, sheep, or horses. Again, those small mammals or those birds. And it's also this life stage that is most associated with humans becoming infected with tick-borne pathogens. They're very small, so they're hard to see. Uh, and that's why that occurs. After dropping off of the second host, it'll then molt into an adult where it'll feed on a third host, which tends to be a mid-size or larger mammal. The primary host that we hear about is white-tailed deer, but they can also feed on rabbits, coyotes, raccoons, skunks, etc. The adult ticks will then reproduce on this larger mammal, uh, where the female will then overwinter again and lay her eggs the following spring. In Canada, this life cycle typically takes two to three years because of our winters, but it can go much faster in parts of the US where there's not as much seasonality. But what's important to note is that these three key players, the tick vector, the vertebrate host, and these different pathogens are really required to all be in the same location at the same time in order for pathogens and tick populations to become established within the area. And as Dr. Kerr was explaining, tick and host populations are becoming more and more impacted by their environment. So it could be climactic variations such as variability in temperature or in humidity conditions, or it could be habitat modifications where 
uh, land use changes and there's more forest patches instead of connected forest systems. This will then impact the tick and host populations where it can increase their abundances, which leads to potentially more disease risk. Or we also have those poleward range shifts where the hosts are now transporting tick populations poleward further into Canada. And the ticks and their pathogens require modes of dispersal by their hosts. So this can either happen over very long distances or very short distances. For long distances, this tends to occur through uh, migratory birds, where birds that are coming back on their migratory route will rest at stopover sites within the United States where ticks can drop off and new ticks can uh, start feeding. So this happens at a very large macroecological scale where ticks that previously were not uh, found in Canada may be found. So we tend to refer to these as adventitious ticks that represent single sort of events, but if you have enough single events, the population can establish. There's also short distances within, let's say, forested areas where mammals or ground foraging birds can move ticks on a very local scale from forest patch to forest patch or through fields. And this is important to know where hosts are dispersing because it'll sort of allow us to know where ticks are located currently in Canada. So this was uh, last year uh, on eTIC where all of the different individuals can voluntarily submit pictures of ticks that are found all across Canada, where we see that the highest densities of submissions were in Ontario, Quebec, and parts of the Atlantic provinces. These are mostly associated with black-legged black ticks. There's also a lot of submissions in Western Canada and British Columbia that are more associated with dermacenter ticks, so dog ticks or Rocky Mountain wood ticks, as well as Western black-legged ticks. But we can see that all of a sudden there's now submissions that are occurring all the way north in the Northwest Territories and the Yukon, which may not have been the case even five, 10 years ago. And this is especially important because as ticks are moving more forward, they are also transmitting a greater number of tick-borne diseases. So this is showing that the number of cases of reported Lyme disease, which have been diagnosed uh, through serology testing, have increased significantly through time. And we know Lyme disease the most because it's the most common uh, tick-borne disease that's uh, caused by the bacteria Borrelia burgdorferi. But there's also a whole slew of other diseases that are starting to make their appearance and become more increased in prevalence throughout Canada, such as anaplasmosis, which is anaplasma bacteria, babesiosis, which is babesia protozoans, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, which is rickettsia bacteria, and Powassan virus, which is a flavivirus. So what we wanted to do in this study is we wanted to determine just which emerging or re-emerging tick-borne pathogens were located at these different sites in the tick specimens and also small mammal specimens. And we also wanted to determine if certain pathogens were much more prevalent than others. These field surveys happened at a macroecological scale, so very large distances at 16 different sites in Ontario and Quebec. But what was most important is that these sites were selected because of their different degrees of Lyme disease risk. So sites that are in Southern Ontario and Southern Quebec are associated with very high disease risks because of their endemic tick populations, the ones that annually reproduce. Whereas sites that are in uh, Southeastern Ontario near Algonquin Park or Southeastern Quebec are associated with less uh, Lyme disease risk or the vectors just have not made their way there yet. At each of these sites, we conducted field surveys. So this included tick dragging, where we would go out and collect questing ticks uh, and feeding ticks as well on the small mammals, which I would identify uh, using dichotomous keys and microscopy, where we would find a whole variety of different tick species. The one that we know the most about is black-legged ticks. Uh, and we found them at the majority of our sites, but I was also able to find a instance of a bird tick. Our second most common tick was actually rabbit ticks, uh, which were especially prevalent in Quebec, and then one instance of a squirrel tick as well. 
At each of these sites, we also conducted small mammal trapping using Sherman traps in order to sort of understand what the small mammal community was locally at each of these sites. Uh, we especially wanted to know where these mice were. So this is an example of a white-footed mouse, um, which is the most highly competent uh, host, reservoir host for these different tick species. They're very good at feeding ticks and they're also very, very good at transmitting tick-borne pathogens. So knowing where these mice are located is especially a, a good piece of information. And based off of these uh, specimens that we collected, we had a lot of different larval pools, which were either sampled while they were questing by grid, or if they were all feeding from the same host, uh, we had a variety of nymphs and some adults as well. We also tested 105 small mammals that were collected across all of our different sites. And to do this, we extracted their DNA, uh, ran nested PCRs, and then tested for a variety of different pathogens that uh, might be located at these different field sites. So Anaplasma, Babesia microti, Borrelia burgdorferi are some of the pathogens that are known to be more prevalent within Canada. We also uh, wanted to look at Babesia otocoli. And I especially wanted to look at this because we've seen recently that there's been a few instances of Babesia otocoli in some of the locations where my study sites were uh, were selected. So we wanted to see what the extent was of this pathogen. In rabbit ticks only, we also tested for Francisella tularensis, which can cause tularemia, and Rickettsia rickettsii, which can cause Rocky Mountain spotted fever, since this tick species is a known vector of those two pathogens. Based off of positive uh, PCRs, we would sequence those samples and then would confirm the pathogen species with GenBank. And based off of this information, we can know which pathogens were in tick species and which were in small mammals. So this is a map of what the results look like, where larger circles means that a lot more ticks were present, so that's tick abundance, and where little orange crosses are located, it means that no ticks were present in those locations. In our tick specimens, we found three different pathogen species, so Babesia otocoli, Borrelia burgdorferi, and Rickettsia rickettsii. But the thing that's most interesting about this is this one location that sort of agglomerates a few of our sites in Quebec, where both Babesia otocoli and Rickettsia rickettsii were found uh, outside of their range limits as found in current surveillance efforts. So we identified this as potentially an undetected hotspot where this, uh, these two pathogens are occurring. Babesia otocoli is starting to become a lot more widespread geographically, especially in the southern areas of Canada. And Rickettsia rickettsii had not been found previously in Canada, uh, in Quebec rather, even historically. So this is a really uh, important finding. Looking at local pathogen prevalence, we saw that there was a little bit of variability amongst the pathogens where uh, questing ticks had a range between 14 to 100% of pathogen prevalence, whereas feeding ticks range from 20 to 100%. Uh, Rickettsia rickettsii, as I just said, was located in that hotspot location, whereas the other two pathogens, Babesia otocoli and Borrelia burgdorferi, were located in those endemic areas of black-legged tick populations, so in southern Ontario and southern Quebec, really close to the uh, border. Next, we looked at what pathogens were in small mammal hosts. And we only found four instances of infected small mammals, uh, which consisted of three pathogen species, namely Babesia otocoli, Babesia microti, and Hepatozoon species. Um, but the one that I think is the most interesting is this instance in a shrew in our most southeastern site in Canada, where we detected Babesia otocoli, which is the first time it's been detected in a shrew, and to my knowledge, in a small mammal which is very interesting since this pathogen is typically found in cervids. So it's been found in deer and elk, uh, especially in Western Canada, but also some singular instances in Ontario and Quebec. But what's interesting is that this pathogen has also recently been found in multiple songbird species in Southern Quebec. Uh, so future surveillance, especially looking at this particular pathogen would be really interesting to see 
if we're potentially missing uh, the detection of certain hosts that are helping to transmit this pathogen. Again, local pathogen prevalence in these small mammals was a lot lower than what we found in the feeding ticks, where it ranged from 10% to about 17%. Again, we saw that there was only that one instance of Babesia in southeastern Quebec, but for Babesia microti and Hepatozoon, we saw that they again were located in those very endemic areas for black-legged ticks. So that southeastern, south, uh, southern Ontario location, as well as these southern Quebec areas. However, some of the, the pathogens that we detected actually can be transmitted in different ways rather than the typical way that we think of with ticks where a tick feeds on an infected host and it continues to be passed back and forth between the host and the tick. Uh, two of these pathogens, Babesia oligocoli and Rickettsia rickettsii, can actually be transmitted transoverally which means that an infected adult female can potentially transmit this pathogen to its eggs where larvae, a few of the larvae may become infected with these pathogens. In nature, it does not occur as frequently as there's only partial pathogen transmission, which can lead to low infection rates. There's also differences in strain virulence. So rickettsia is a uh, tick-borne pathogen that is really known to have uh, very varying levels of virulence. Some strains are very, very pathogenic, which can actually kill uh, ticks, whereas others are non-pathogenic. And finally, it requires these very short time periods where a tick can become infected because the pathogen needs to be at a very high level of circulation uh, within the host, which usually only occurs for three to four days. The second possible mode of transmission, especially with the hepatozoon species, is that it requires the ingestion of an infected arthropod. However, these arthropods can be anything from fleas to mites to ticks. There's a really wide array of with which arthropods can become infected, which means that the uh, mouse that was found to have this hepatozoon species most likely ingested an infected arthropod, which could have been through accidental ingestion, either grooming itself or conspecifics within the nest, or it could have been through intentional ingestion while it was feeding as arthropods can be a part of their diet. And finally, the implications of this study uh, for future surveillance efforts um, are related to things that typically do not occur in current surveillance efforts in Canada. So typically certain tick-borne pathogens like Babesia otocoli or Rickettsia rickettsii are not always tested in uh, pathogen testing. Uh, since Babesia otocoli has only been sort of recently found in Canada, it's become more and more tested, but there still is room to improve. And Rickettsia rickettsii is really a re-emerging pathogen where there were only sporadic instances of it uh, found historically. So the fact that we found it all within one location in this area could point to uh, needing more observations in this area so that we can determine uh, what the extent of this pathogen is. As well, current surveillance efforts typically do not test questing larvae because many of the tick-borne pathogens do not uh, occur through transovarial transmission. But the fact that certain pathogens such as Babesia coli and Rickettsia rickettsii were found and can be transmitted transoferally, it points to potentially including uh, these, these uh, questing larvae as well in pathogen testing. So we made the call for more comprehensive testing and which should focus on very two specific aspects. One, that tick individuals from all life stages should be assessed irrespective of their activity. So questing larvae should be included uh, within that assessment and additional non-targeted tick-borne pathogens should also be included in these assessments. Um, as I stated, a lot of these ticks are being brought through migratory movements. So uh, certain tick-borne pathogens may be transported uh, through those ticks that are being brought here by birds and including them in these um, comprehensive testing is really required as they may not be located here now, but we'd rather be proactive in the approach to determine when a pathogen becomes present in Canada than reactive and finding out sort of like Babesia otocoli uh, that there's a much greater extent than we had thought of. And this could typically uh, be um, 
this could actually be impacting human populations in these areas without us being aware. Uh, with that, uh, that concludes my part of the presentation. I will now be passing it off to Dr. Millian, who will be speaking more about biodiversity and its impact on Lyme disease emergence. Thank you, Kirsten, for introducing me, my talk and it's very very thorough and a great presentation of your results uh, where we've seen that emerging pathogens are indeed present in Canada when you look for it. And I want to build on this and present you the results of the work that we've done in my lab for over a decade now. And looking at um, pattern of emergence, both in space and time, with a focus on Lyme disease, because when we started to work, this is what we had uh, available in our study area in southern Quebec. Okay, so this is not working. All right. So uh, back to the very general approach. Uh, which my colleague Jeremy Kerr introduced uh, as well on how um, we're using uh, large scale data on uh, the environment and um, to predict um, the prevalence of a particular pathogen or a host species or a vector species. And this is an approach that we're using because of how much this environment is changing and its impact on the distribution of the species from all the species that are involved in the disease, in the, the disease system from the pathogen to the vector to the host. And this is an example. You've seen the example of the butterflies and the bumblebee from um, Jeremy Kerr's lab work that he presented. This is another example um, for mammals in Canada, published in 2017 by Denis Murray, where they're showing the uh, predicted the model using these environmental data, climate data, temperature, precipitation, and so on. They predicted the future distribution under climate warming in these 12 species. And what I wanted to uh, emphasize with that is the fact that the changes in um, number of species at a given place at a certain time is not the same all across. So you have areas in uh, the most southern area, the cold edge, where there's a net loss in the number of species, whereas in the northern uh, edge, the warm edge, we predict an increase in the number in species diversity in the number of species. Um, now, if of course these species are either vector or host, you can imagine that they're going to bring with them uh, the pathogens for which they are the host. So in Canada, we're particularly uh, exposed to that uh, um, future change uh, with, despite a global decrease in biodiversity, we're in a biodiversity crisis in Northern latitude in, uh, in Canada, but other parts of the, of the world, we are actually seeing an increase in the number of species because of the species tracking their thermal, optimal thermal condition. And with climate warming, they're able to colonize further north, northern areas. So what is the impact on the emergence of pathogen? We're zooming in here to my uh, playground 
This is an area south of Montreal. Montreal Island here is shown on the little inset the map. And south of that is a landscape of mix of agricultural fields and little islands of forest patches. Um, and we've been sampling uh, small mammals and black legged ticks um, for several years in that region. I circle one site in particular, it's a gold nature reserve at Mont Saint Hilaire. Um, and the reason why, one of the reasons why we went with my students to sample small mammals in that area is that I was not the first one to do that in the 1970s. Uh, Peter Grant, who's very well known for Darwin fishes, uh, his work on the evolution and, uh, of species on islands and focus, uh, the focus of the, on the Darwin finches. Well, before doing finches, Peter Grant was doing mice and small mammals, and he had been collecting uh, small mammals uh, in the 1970s. And before that, um, McGill um, researchers had been working in, in uh, Mont Saint-Hilaire and other Monte Region hills all around. So we had access to collections in the museum, the Red Path Museum at McGill of small mammals that were collected year after year because it was what people were doing in these days um, of small mammals communities. And so what I'm showing you is one example that particular locality, but bear in mind that everywhere we've looked in that region, we saw the same pattern. So we looked at the change in the number of species, we compared the number of species, but also the composition of the small mammal communities at each of these sites. Um, and what we found, so this is, we're talking 50 years, what we found is that there was not only a decrease in the number of species, so less diversity locally, but also a complete change turnover in which species were present. So, and we attributed this to uh, climate warming. So the effect here of climate warming, when you look at the large scale, we were able to predict the future distribution and estimate the future number of species, whether it's gonna increase there or decrease there. But when you zoom in locally, you can uh, then look at the detail of which species is occurring where and with whom it's coexisting. And this is um, extremely important to understand um, the role of these communities as a whole in transmitting, maintaining a pathogen in the ecosystem. The reason why is because uh, like, as my colleague, sorry, I lost my windows for a minute. My uh, colleague Kirsten uh, showed you the uh, mentioned the different competence level uh, of uh, these hosts for different pathogens. In the case of Borrelia, Burgdorferi for Lyme disease, the species of interest is the white-footed mouse. The white-footed mouse only invaded the region south of Montreal. Um, a few decades ago, um, at the time when Peter Grant was working in the 1970s, the white-footed mouse was rare. Um, less than 20% of the mouse individual uh, that he collected were white-footed mice. The, on the other hand, the abundant species at the time, so 1970, this is yesterday. I mean, I was born then. Um, the most abundant one was the deer mouse. This is our endemic mouse in uh, Quebec. In, it goes up to James Bay. It's well adapted to our climatic condition. Now with climate warming, white-footed mouse is moving up north. 
and taking over, out compete completely. So whenever we've been, wherever we've been sampling, when we found the white-footed mouse, we didn't find the deer mouse or very few of them. This is important for Lyme disease and the emergence of Lyme disease in the, in the region because the white-footed mouse is known to be way more competent over 90% of chances of transmitted Borrelia to a, a tick feeding on it um, when compared to the deer mouse where estimates uh, is, is less than 40% chance depending on the study, but it's much lower competence. Now, I'm gonna attempt to uh, talk about the effect of changes in community composition and number of species on the net, the prevalence of a pathogen in an ecosystem. So there's two team, there's team amplification and team dilution. And there's a lot of discussion around here. Around that topic, um, um, team amplification is uh, based on the premise that by pure stochastic, it's just a game number. If ticks have access to more hosts to feed on, then there's going to be more ticks. And just because there's more ticks, then there's going to be more pathogen. Just ma mathematic effect. So if we're in an area where there's an increase in biodiversity, you would increase, you would expect to uh, find more of that pathogen, more ticks, more abundant, and more pathogen in the ecosystem overall. Now, if we look uh, closer to these host species and take into account that into account the fact that some of these are competent hosts as opposed to others that are not at all, then we're talking about the dilution effect. And what matters is not so much how many species there are, it's how many of the competent hosts there is in the community. So it's the relative uh, proportion of the competent host in the community that's gonna um, increase the prevalence of a pathogen in an ecosystem. So it's called the dilution effect because ticks that are feeding on a non-competent host um, are wasting their bite. It's not a good way for maintaining and spreading the pathogen within the host community. The effect is diluted. So the question is, which is... Um, the mechanism driving the emergence of Lyme disease in um, southern Quebec. So that's what we looked into. First of all, we um, looked at an area where Lyme disease is endemic. Because at the time when we started to work on that system, there were 11 cases, human cases of Lyme disease in Quebec. That was in 2009. Um, today we are at 500 cases, I, um, which makes up about a quarter uh, of uh, human Lyme disease cases in Canada. So 11 cases was not really a lot to work with. And we wanted to compare um, endemic areas where Lyme disease and tick populations were established to our system where it was happening in front of our eyes, live emerging. And we were going to track that. So what was happening in a endemic area, we used the data from the CDC on human cases and um, um, mapped the, well, uh, change from 1992 to 2011 uh, human cases. So overall it increased, that was not a surprise. But what we did is looked at the spatial distribution of these cases and the, the highest occurrence of human cases was in the north, uh, two clusters and uh, including one in the northeastern uh, US. Then we looked at the host 
diversity, so that is the number of species. We included in that all the small mammals and birds that are known to um, feed um, um, black-legged ticks. And what we found is that overall there was while well, taking into account that spatial variation, there was a negative relation between the number of human, human Lyme disease cases and the number of species of host at a given place. So that's a signature of a dilution effect, negative relation. The more species, the less cases, but um, um, what we found too is that that effect um, had gotten stronger in time. So you see on the right, that graph shows that relationship between human cases and the number of host species. In 1992, it's negative, but it's relatively flat, whereas in 2011, it had become much more st steep. So the effect uh, is much stronger. So that's dilution effect. Uh, when looking at human cases at a large scale in an endemic area where ticks have been, tick population has have been established um, for much longer than in southern Quebec, we're talking about 100,000 uh, cases in the US. And then we moved back to Quebec and uh, worked at um, over 30 sites for three years, visited the same sites for three years and collected ticks and small mammals. Um, a total of ticks had, was 870 ticks and at the time most of them by far were uh, black-legged ticks. I think Kirsten now would want to go back and she'll, I'm sure she'll find other species. Um, and for the small mammals, we collected uh, 1,200 and so, and most of them, well, nearly half, uh, over half of them were white-footed mice. Um, some of them very collaborative and uh, each, uh, each one of them uh, had gotten their little trap at that particular site. So lots of white-footed mice and lots of ticks to work with. So the idea there was to cover the area where we knew ticks were present and starting to establish. So this is 2011. At the time, it's less than 100 human uh, cases of Lyme disease in the, in the region. Um, so we went in the south of southern Quebec, <laughs> close to the border, known areas for a few endemic populations. I could, could count them on my hand at the time. But then we also covered uh, the known distribution of the white-footed mouse and beyond. We went in areas where the white-footed mouse was not there to really assess its role in the occurrence of Lyme disease. So. When you look at the uh, composition of the small mammal host community, it's, uh, it appears to be nested. By nested, we mean that each um, community is a subset of uh, the smaller community in terms of number of species. In other words, there are sites where when there's, uh, there's rare species that um, occur uh, only at one site and then so on, and then you build on. So the most uh, common species occur at all the sites. And in that case, we found that it was the short-tailed shrew, Blarina brevicoda, and the white-footed mouse, Peromyscus leucopus. And it appears that these are the most, the two most competent reservoir uh, hosts for Borrelia, and also uh, very efficient at feeding ticks, a large number of ticks. These are the competence values for the white-footed mouse, it's uh, 93%, and for the short-tailed shrew, it's 51%. So half a chance to um, infect a tick that's feeding on it. So the, this is the condition for dilution to occur, because when there's not too many species, 
um, it's the it's the most competent host that's present. So this is how it looks like uh, when we tested uh, for Borrelia um, the ticks that we collected, and we found that um, well, first of all, the uh, I think I skipped a slide, thank you. So first of all, um, the <laughs> Borrelia was uh, more prevalent in the southern uh, area of, a, of, a, of a, in the southern site of our study area. So I circled this in red and that's our endemic uh, region with where tick population are established that is they're surviving the winter. So uh, the pathogen is, uh, is present and it's ours, it's endemic. It's not brought over and over every year by migratory birds, as opposed to the area in blue where it's emerging, uh, an, an, an area of emergence for Borrelia because the ticks that are found there and Borrelia are not endemic, they're not established. The ticks are not surviving the winter. They just keep coming back and there's a complete turnover each year of the tick uh, population. And we've shown this, that this is occurring using genetic markers. So we really have the, a, a beautiful system there where we can compare what's happening in an endemic versus an emerging region in terms and does the relation between host diversity and prevalence of Borrelia, um, does it hold all across? Is it comparable? And this is how it looks like. So first we look at the effect of the abundance uh, or diversity of small mammals. It's the same relationship. Um, and so it's, um, effect is positive. That means that uh, where there were more small mammals, um, well, it's not a positive effect, sorry. In areas where we had more small mammals, we had um, less um, Borrelia, Whereas in endemic uh, areas, what we're looking at is more the effect of uh, the white-footed mouse. Uh, so we concluded, so if you increase the number of small mammals, you had um, uh, um, more Borrelia in the endemic areas. And then what matters is, uh, in, in what matters is the um, relative importance of the white-footed mouse in established uh, and endemic areas. So what we concluded is um, that both amplification and dilution can happen when you look at the big picture, but the relation between the diversity of host or the relative importance of a specific host um, competent host in the community is going to change over time, which is equivalent to changing over space, whether we're in a region of um, established population of ticks or emerging um, newly established, established population of ticks. And um, this is a conclusion that's uh, been it's been suggested very re relatively recently. So it's not a yes or no um, uh, answer that both mechanisms can play a role. And in particular in areas of emergence, this is a very important result um, given the fact that the number of species is changing in these areas. So it's like, we're going, we're closing the loop here by increasing the number of species. What's the consequence on the spread and prevalence of a pathogen? Well, with our uh, study at a very small scale, both in space and over time, 
we show that that increasing number of species uh, will have an amplification effect on the prevalence of that particular pathogen, as opposed to what we observe in endemic areas like in the US. And on that, uh, this is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, to our presenters. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, just to be conscious of time, I won't take any additional questions. Um, I will just read out the ones that are currently in the Q&A box, if that's okay with our presenters. Um, but if anyone does have any additional questions, please feel free to email me. Um, I will put my email in the chat um, and I would be happy to connect you with any of our presenters. Um, first question, hi, Kirsten, thanks for the talk. How do you think human population density changes pathogen prevalence for non-human pathogens, uh, B. oticoli, versus human pathogens, B. burgdorferi? Um, yeah, so the first thing to say is, is that unfortunately, Babesia oticoli has been found in humans. So um, <laughs> there have been people diagnosed with Babesiosis based off of this uh, particular species. Um, just that that's an, a, an additional note. Um, otherwise, human po population density is going to have a lot of impact on land use changes. Uh, and it's also going to have a lot of impact on contact opportunities. So um, very dense locations are obviously going to have uh, a bit more urban, urban, urban uh, areas. And it might create more patched forest areas or more agricultural matrixes. Because of this, it's gonna essentially change how host communities are composed. So there'll be a lot more habitat generalists such as that white-footed mouse thriving, which could increase uh, disease risk in those areas. Um, and then in association with just greater number of people in those areas, if you're a greater number of people going out into those forested areas, there's a, a, a potential for greater contact opportunities with a tick. Um, just in general. Wonderful, thank you, Kirsten. Um, as I said, I just wanna be conscious of everyone's time. So um, I know there are some more Q&A questions uh, coming in to the box. Um, if those attendees could please email me again, I'd be happy to connect you with our presenters um, and just get answers to some of your questions. But I do wanna thank everyone for joining us today and thank you to our wonderful presenters for sharing your time and expertise with us. Um, as a reminder to everyone, please fill out um, the survey that will open up automatically in the webinar um, and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you again. Thank you. Anytime, take care.